Um, my name is Rachel Simone Weil. I am a, um, a Nintendo collector and developer, homebrew developer and video game historian. I actually gave my first Nerd Night talk in I think 2009, which is roughly when this picture is from. And I was uh, collecting Nintendo games back then and um, still, still up to shenanigans now. So it's kind of cool to come full circle like 15 years later, right? Um, I uh, realized I didn't advance a slide. That's the photo I was talking about. Um, so I also founded Femicom Museum, which is a um, physical and digital hybrid uh, archive uh, that really focuses on the history of girls, video games, and electronic toys uh, from the 20th century. And uh, it, it somewhat overlaps with my talk tonight because, uh, you know, sewing and knitting and embroidering have sort of traditionally been associated with mm, women and girls, you know, in particular if we're talking about 20th century Western culture. So I want to pause the caveat and say I'm not pro-gender stereotype. Uh, it's just that, you know, as a historian, culture affects artifacts, like artifacts don't come out of a vacuum, and gender stereotypes affect what video games are like. And if we decided to throw away video games that had gender stereotypes in them, which people have actually suggested that I do. <laughs> Weird. Um, but if we threw out all games that had gender stereotypes, we'd have to throw out um, pretty much all video <laughs> games. <laughs> and I don't think I could make a good case for, for that. So we're kind of stuck with it. So that's just my little rant. I'm not pro-gender stereotype, but it is part of you know, my academic interest, my scholarly interest, and it's just sort of a part of video game and, and the toy industry at large. Um, all right, so we'll get back to the topic at hand. So, uh, we're talking about Nintendo peripheral devices. We're talking about controllers or hardware that isn't the video game console itself, but is kind of ancillary to it. And, and Nintendo's been doing this for a long time. You could put your Switch in a cardboard box, and it's like a fishing pole, like this is a Nintendo Labo. So they've been doing this um, recently, a wild, t classic Nintendo move. Um, but actually, they've been doing this for decades. So we have, um, we have pressed the wrong button. There we go. Uh, we have items that have been made by Nintendo. So we have things like the pedometer for the Wii U. They've actually made pedometers a couple times as Nintendo. Um, and those are these sort of first party peripherals uh, that Nintendo makes to kind of make play more exciting or innovative or they're, they're trying something new, right? Um, they do this a lot with fitness, fitness peripherals. And then we have those peripherals that are made by third party companies that aren't Nintendo. And sometimes other companies just, they, they see a need in the market and then they go, I bet we could, make, we could partner with Nintendo and make something cool. And there's all sorts of peripheral devices uh, that have accompanied Nintendo game consoles throughout time. I just put a few up here. This is like not at all comprehensive. We're going to look at a few more. But this is an uh, easy piano for DS, which is like a keyboard attachment. And then we have the extra gaming bike that has an embedded Super Nintendo and television. So you can ride your bike and play these mountain biking simulations on the Super Nintendo. I'm sure they were super realistic in the 16-bit era. But we're talking about knitting, embroidering, sewing, so let's jump in. Um, this is the Singer Game Boy sewing machine uh, released in, I believe, 2001. And so the idea here, this is an example of a device that was not, this didn't come out of Nintendo. Nintendo is not trying to corner the sewing demographic. <laughs> um, rather, this what came out of um, you know, sewing machine industry. They were looking at their customer base and saying, wow, you know, most people that come into our stores and purchase sewing machines are seniors or they're, you know, maybe older adults. And our future customers, young people, aren't really interested in sewing these days. How could we make it more exciting? And so they had this idea to um, make a Game Boy controlled sewing machine. <laughs> And at first, this might seem like, oh, that seems like a stretch. But let me tell you why it wasn't exactly a stretch, totally. Um, at this time, uh, not every device came with a screen 
built on, right? And, and not every device was computerized. And getting a computerized sewing machine at this time was pretty expensive. And here, we, you know, Singer kind of realized, hey, kids like Game Boy. It's got a screen, it's got buttons, it's got a link cable, so we can send data back and forth. And we could actually use a Game Boy as the brains of the sewing machine to select stitch patterns and even do some basic letter embroidering. Um, and it was actually kind of a pretty, I think, novel idea. And of course, you know, Game Boy's cool, so we'll get that youth demographic. Um, here's a close-up of the software. And you can pick things like different stitch sizes, buttonholes. Um, this was not a standard feature of sewing machines, like, historically. And certainly not one where you had a visual screen where you could scroll through. Um, this is common on sewing machines today, but in 2001, it was not. So it was kind of cool. Um, they tested this with kids and teens, and it was actually um, pretty well received, but it didn't sell well. It, it did okay in the market, but it didn't sell great, and they did discontinue it, I think, within a year. Um, and that was in the U.S. However, in Japan, it had a little bit of a longer lifespan, and there were actually three models of this machine made. Um, some of them did embroidery as well, and so they had a different machine that had embroidery, and you could um, embroider Mario characters onto your clothing, which is pretty cool. Um, this is an advertisement f uh, for that, and if you can read Japanese, you'll see this is actually an ad for two games. One is called Mario Family, uh, which, as you might imagine, lets you embroider Mario on your clothes, and the other one um, is called Kirby Family, and it was sadly canceled. Um, sorry, Kirby fans. Uh, yeah, it was never released, uh, except in 2020, uh, 20 years after it was supposed to have come out, uh, more or less, uh, the ROM was leaked and put on archive.org. <laughs> so anyone out there who has a Japanese Jaguar embroidery machine <laughs> with Game Boy cable can now finally put King DDD on your jean jacket. <laughs> yes. Um, I don't know, this is cute. I, it, it, it didn't sell well, but um, I think it's, it's an interesting story of you know, a, a third party company trying to build a peripheral. Also, I just wanna take a moment and say, I love the iMac aesthetic. <laughs> Remember, this is 2001, so everything is like clear, transparent plastic computers. I love that it just coordinates with the iMac so beautifully. Um, but yeah, this is, uh, you know, maybe not a success story, um, but a, a pretty interesting and novel idea uh, that, that could have gone better. I think one thing to keep in mind, and we'll see this with um, the next device that I'm talking about, is it's hard to sell a machine like this. Think about in the, in the year 2000, people buy video games at Toys R Us or at GameStop. Sewing machines are not sold at Toys R Us or GameStop, right? And these devices, these Game Boy controlled sewing machines, were sold at like Singer distributors. Well, kids don't go there, right? And so there's always this problem when you have a very specialty peripheral, the toy store has to carry it, the video game store has to carry it, or it is dead in the water. And I think that's what happened with this device. And it's, it's probably what would have happened with the next one we're gonna look at. So, for the next one, we're going to travel further back in time to 1986. <laughs> More or less, night 85, 86. So, uh, this is when Nintendo brings its first video game console to the U.S., right? So, it's been uh, the NES known as the Famicom in Japan, came out in 83 in Japan, and they're bringing it to the U.S. market. And Nintendo doesn't really know what the U.S. video game market is going to be like. Atari and arcade games were very popular in the late 70s, early 80s. Then we had the video game crash of 1983, and everyone thought, I think video games are a fad. I think we're done. And Nintendo was like, well, we got to do something a little bit different, right? They didn't want to be seen as a fad. They wanted to come back in the U.S. and really um, do something different to be successful. And so part of their strategy was around peripherals, right? They wanted the Nintendo to not seem like it was just a toy. They wanted to seem like something that everyone in the family could enjoy. And they, they thought of peripherals as kind of the way to extend the joy of Nintendo to all members of the family. So we had things like 
Rob the Robot, which we're going to talk about again in a second, the NES Zapper, which is the, the light gun. Um, we have some things that didn't come out, like the Nintendo Basic Keyboard and the Data Cassette Deck uh, modems, you know, all sorts of things. This, uh, this particular keyboard did not come out. But Nintendo's just, at this time, is just sort of like spitballing, like how can we be different than the Atari, which ended up, you know, kind of being at this moment of a big video game crash. So, so put ourselves in the time of 1986. This is the first Christmas where kids are getting the NES, and we don't really know what, what that demographic is gonna be. It turns out Nintendo discovers pretty quickly that it is actually kids, and they give up on the grown-ups. But for a moment, they're catering to possible different ideas. And that's where we get this, the most famous reindeer of all, the um, mysterious, elusive Nintendo knitting machine. Um, so this is a prototype. This was never released. In fact, um, this is the only official document from Nintendo that suggests it ever existed. Um, this was posted on Facebook about 15 years ago by an, a former Nintendo employee. And I remember seeing it 15 years ago and thinking, that's fake. <laughs> that ain't right. That's <laughs> not real. But it is real. Um, the flyer was sold or, or acquired by uh, the Video Game History Foundation. And um, yeah, it's, it's possibly the only copy in existence. We'll talk about that in a minute. But uh, yeah, this is all that was known about it. And so for 15 years, th this is it. it was, this is the story. There was this flyer and there was this knitting machine and I guess it never came out. Um, so uh, I thought this would be good, a research project, right? Let's like figure out what was the story back here. So I'm gonna talk uh, about the Nintendo knitting machine and, and the true history of this prototype, as far as we can tell. Um, so first of all, what is a knitting machine? Um, it sounds like something where you throw yarn in and a sweater comes out. <laughs> That is not what a knitting machine is. Um, unfortunately, it's kind of, it's a, it's a it's human powered machine. So there's a bed of needles and a carriage and you loop the yarn on this bed of needles and you move the carriage back and forth and that knits um, sweater or whatever. You can change the color of yarn, you can change the stitch pattern, but you're doing it by hand. It's still faster than hand knitting. Um, it's just an, an alternative to hand knitting. Um, but it's, it's not like fully automated, but that's what a knitting machine is. Um, so you got to think as a historian, you're like, okay, what do I have to go on here? It's just a flyer. We don't have the prototype. We don't know who worked on it. We have no other corroborating information. What can we learn about this device just from the flyer? And there are two things that caught my eye. Um, the first is this controller. So this is a NES, standard NES controller that's like plugged into some kind of holdy thing on the knitting machine. Don't know why, but that's interesting. So we're gonna investigate that. And then the other is, of course, this game, presumably that has a knitting pattern or something on it. Now, fortunately, I recognized what was on the screen because I have this software. Now I said the knitting machine never came out, but in Japan, there was knitting software uh, called I Am A Teacher Super Mario Sweater. Actually, there, were, there was a set. There was one that teaches hand knitting and another that lets you make your own Mario sweaters with, with patterns. Um, this came out in 1986. Um, and uh, yeah, I actually have a copy of it. So, so it came out, it exists. Um, one thing that's kind of interesting about this software is, um, so it has patterns for sweaters. There's stitch counters along the bottom. Those are those numbers you see. One thing to note is that hand knitting and machine knitting um, actually like don't work the same way. So in hand knitting, you work a row, you flip the piece over, and you work the back. Whereas in machine knitting, you're always working from the front of the garment. And so it was clear to me that this is the software we saw on screen, but this would never have worked with machine knitting. So interesting. Put that in my put that in my back pocket. Um, <laughs> the other thing, so we're looking at the software, and we see this name Royal. Um, I say we. This is um, me and my my 
colleague and friend at the Video Game History Foundation who were fascinated with this story. We see the name Royal at the bottom. And we're like, man, what is Royal? Who, like, what did they make other games? And uh, we couldn't find out a lot about the company Royal because they went bankrupt in 2014. But we used a Wayback Machine and we found their website from 2002. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a good one. Um, so we wanted to know, like, what was Royal's deal? Were they a video game publisher or what? It turns out that they were a toy manufacturer, hmm, appliance maker. And uh, we learned that they made some crafting toys. They made some knitting toys. And we thought maybe, just maybe, Royal was involved in this knitting machine project. And then I get a DM from Frank, and he says, I've been watching the auction sites and I found two knitting machines made by Royal that came out in 1988 and 1989 or something. I bought both of them. And one of them is for you. <laughs> and I said, all right, I'm coming to San Francisco. <laughs> um, I don't know how rare these are, but I will say that um, no more of these have come up since April. So take that for what you will. Um, so we're pretty excited. We've got two Royal made knitting machines on the way. Um, and we take them out of the box, and they look pretty close. <laughs> not perfect, not exactly the same, but pretty dang close. And so we're thinking, okay, Nintendo asked Royal to make this, or Royal asked Nintendo to make some. They were working together to make a knitting machine for use with the Nintendo. Now, again, it wouldn't have worked with their software because hand knitting works totally different than machine knitting. But, you know, you could probably hack, hack it, and you could just remake the game, it's probably be fine. So now that we've got this connection, we go to find international patents, do an international patent search for Royal, because now we know what we're sort of looking for. And we find this, which is a patent filed by Royal in 1986 or seven for a knitting, computerized knitting device with something that looks a heck of a lot like a Nintendo controller. And we're pretty sure this is a patent for this thing. <laughs> yeah, amazing. Um, so I'm still curious about this, this question of what does that controller do? Like, is there a data port in there? Like, is it sending data to the knitting machine and it's something's happening or is it going the other way? And so I look through this patent and some kind of Google Translate and all of that. And um, I find this diagram. So there's a pinball flipper-like mechanism that just presses a button. And when that button is pressed on the controller, it advances a row on the screen on the game. So this giant piece of plastic, all it does is press a button, which of course you could do with your finger. <laughs> um, and if you think that's weird, let me introduce you to my friend Rob. This is a robot operating buddy. Um, if you're under the age of 35, you may know this is a Smash Brothers fighter. <laughs> um, so Rob is like a robot with infrared eyes and gyroscopes, and it moves around and all this amazing stuff, but at the end of the day, it is just pushing a button on the controller, which is something you could do with your just regular finger. Um, and I, I will show you, I took a part of a Rob just to demonstrate. This is, the <laughs> this is the piece the gyroscope lands on, and it's just pressing a button on the controller. <laughs> and this was like a successful toy, so <laughs> I don't know what to tell you, but they've already done this strategy. It's just a really big piece of plastic that pushes a button for you. All right, so, um, so mystery solved, right? We kind of we figured this thing out. There's just something about this photo that doesn't feel right to me. Okay, I know it's like, it's hand knitting, not machine knitting. I already talked about that. I don't really see this pinball flipper mechanism in this photo. Like d I just don't know where that fits up there. Maybe it's under the machine. And then I think, you know, uh, well, this game never it came out in Japan. It was never on the NES, so obviously that NES isn't running the software. And then I'm like, that power light isn't even on on the NES, <laughs> you know? And then I just keep looking at this photo and I go, you know, that, that sleeve isn't even attached to the needles. You know, there's these little needles with hooks and the sleeve is just pushed under them. Like a, I don't know, it's not, it's, and then I, I just keep looking at it and there's this other thing that's bothering me. I, this is minor, I know, but it's like the, the pegs, the, the needles are color coded, right? So there's 
four blue ones, four pink, four blue, four pink. And it's kind of weird because every other knitting machine in the world does this by fives. Because when you count stitches, you can go 5, 10, 15, 20. I'm not that good at counting by fours. Kind of weird, but not a big deal. So I thought, well, you know, normally on a, on a knitting machine that goes 5, 10, 15, 20, what does this one do? Does it go 4, 8, 12? And I look at the stickers and it just says A, B, C. <laughs> yeah, right? Is this, a, is this a, are we dealing with a base 16 numbers here? What's going on? Um, this just se uh, d don't seem right. And it wasn't until we looked at our royal knitting machines that we had bought on this auction site that we realized uh, the stickers were in the wrong place. Um, the A, B, and C are supposed to go on the top, which is the, the needle position. And then there are numbers, which of course are supposed to go on the stitch indicators. And you can see in that photo on the left that the, they put the numbers up where the letters are supposed to be, the letters up where the numbers are supposed to be. Don't, what's up? It's just something's not right. Um, and so I, uh, we kind of came up with this hypothesis. This is the story we were telling ourselves, right? Nintendo of America, 1986, Redmond, Washington. They get a big cardboard box in the mail from Nintendo of Japan. It's got a bunch of plastic parts in it and a Famicom disk system game. And they said, can you put this together and do a photo shoot um, like in the next couple days? Because we're going to be demoing this at the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas. Surprise. Oh, I'll, actually, you're going to be demoing it. <laughs> Surprise. OK, bye. <laughs> and there were no instructions. That's what I think may have happened, right? So these Nintendo of America employees get this box of an unassembled knitting machine, which they've never seen before, and they do their best to put it together, and they make a couple of mistakes, like the thing that the, the stitch marker is being in the wrong place. That's my guess. Do we know that that's what happened? No, but that's my story. Um, okay, so then the other question is, what, so what actually happened at CES in Las Vegas in 1987? Well, there's no, um, there's no news coverage of Nintendo being there because there was no video game press in the US in 1987, <laughs> right? It didn't exist. But you know who did have video game press was Japan. And Japanese video game press actually flew to the US, went to CES, and saw this machine being demoed. And they wrote an article about it, and they took a picture of it, and we tracked down that picture. Here it is. <laughs> Wow, oh. this photo makes me feel a lot better than that flyer. The power light is on, yes. Um, the knitting is actually attached to the machine, amazing. There's tension weights on, which you would need to get the right tension uh, for the garment. And um, the screen looks a little bit different, doesn't it? Uh, there's actually a representation of the machine at the bottom of the screen, and this, the stitch counters have been flipped almost like it's meant for machine knitting, so that's pretty cool. Um, and there's one other thing I want to draw your attention to, this little, I don't know how well it's showing up here, down in the bottom right corner. This is a document holder, an acrylic document holder, and you notice there's nothing in it. We believe that is where the one copy of the flyer <laughs> that was made was put. It was in there, and someone took it out. <laughs> And uh, then this picture was, was taken. They probably put it back a couple minutes later. Um, so we do actually think it, it is a, a pretty rare flyer. I got to hold it when I was in San Francisco, which was exciting. Um, yeah, so, okay, so then what? Well, let's infer again. I think what happened is they brought this to CES and they showed it to the head of Toys R Us. And they said, no thank you. Um, and then it never went forward after that. Again, I think this is the same thing that happened with the sewing machine. It is hard to sell something when it doesn't fit in the right aisle. And they were not going to put this in the software aisle at Toys R Us. And Toys R Us was probably the biggest in the US, biggest video game retailer for, for NES. They're not going to put this there. And they have this feeling, which is sort of fueled by gender stereotypes, of girls don't walk down the Nintendo aisle. So they will never even find this if if they're interested in machine knitting. So for whatever reason, it never gets developed. Um, so I, I assume that t Nintendo went back to Royal and said, thank you so much for making that knitting machine for us. We're actually not going to produce it. Sorry. 
Um, and, and this is what I, I kind of think, we had this question of, was Royal in the business of making knitting machines? And I think the answer was no. Nintendo commissioned them as a toy maker to make a knitting machine toy. They made it and then production never went further. What we see is that in 1988 and 89, after this project has been canceled, they just release a standalone knitting machine toy. Um, and they've taken out the controller caddy and uh, they've, they've scrubbed all the references from Nintendo. Almost, almost all of the references. There's one little Easter egg, which I noticed on the box. So there's this girl in her bedroom and she's using the knitting machine and there's a bookshelf behind her with some manga and stuff on it. And if we look at that close up, there's these uh, knitted rice ball pillows and the pillow on the right, if anyone can read Japanese, you know what it says? I love NES. <laughs> <laughs> It's like this big on the box. It's so weird. And this is supposedly after their partnership had fallen apart, so who knows. Royal goes on to revise um, or publish a revised copy of the patent without Nintendo. It's now computer connected, which is still pretty surprising for 87. A lot of people didn't have home computers at that time. I don't think this product ever came out, but issuing a patent doesn't hurt. Um, the last peripheral made was someone's fan replica recreation of the Nintendo knitting machine. This is a, a home NES home brewer, Bunny Boy, who brought this in, I think, 2018 uh, to a convention and had written his own software with a different, a much larger uh, knitting machine. And I don't believe the two were connected. I think the video game was just a reference for the patterns. So kind of a, kind of a sad story that never got made. I think when you go into this, you think there's no way they would ever release a Nintendo knitting machine. That's wild. I mean, I thought it was fake. But consider that right around the corner from the knitting machine demo at CES in Las Vegas in 1987, there was a girl in leg warmers and a full like 80s aerobics outfit demoing the Bandai Family Fun Fitness Pad which Nintendo would later buy and re resell as a power pad, which would be a you know, pretty iconic controller for them for games like track and field. And, um, we, know, we know this now today as the DDR mat. This was the predecessor to that. So it's not that far-fetched, right? If, if aerobics could make it, a knitting machine maybe could have almost made it, and I think that's pretty cool. Um, I don't have the prototype. I don't know that we'll ever have the prototype. But I have the next best thing, which is this really, it looks really close to the prototype. Um, and I think that's pretty cool. I want to glue my Rob pinball mechanism <laughs> to the back of it and see if I can maybe write, just brush off my 6502 assembly language and write some new software for it. And I think that would be um, quite fun. So that's it. Those are all of the, <laughs> those are all of the Nintendo knitting, embroidering, and, and sewing peripherals. But I hope uh, you enjoy this archaeological look at how historians look at devices like this and start with a flyer and end up with something that's um, you know, relatively cool and entertaining. That's all I got. All right, thanks. All right. Are we on? Hey, there's my oh, mic. Can I just okay. say, I had yes. Barbie. I had Barbie in my slides. Yeah, where? Full circle. Scientist, first talk. Barbie, second talk. Right. Scientist Barbie. Well, that it was all my sense. thought, but with the name. So, <laughs> How, how's my volume on this? Sounds low. No, we're good. Okay. That is amazing. I mean, God, the archaeology is incredible. <laughs> and it, it bridges, uh, uh, sorry, I, I'm going to get to your questions. I'm like, I just want to chat with my friend. <laughs> I, I love how it bridges that, that particular time period when technology was booming uh, and, and, and the record of it was, was so incomplete. It's a, it's a lovely era. Okay, questions? Yes. So, as an ex-corporate America guy, I'm kind Me too. of uh, I'm, I'm confused that the Japanese press, this is such a Japanese machine, 
right, to begin with. It's very Japanese. I'm surprised that the Japanese press, who's really into this sort of history of themselves, in a good way, not, in a, not haven't actually found the engineers who did this and actually done an expose. Is there any way we can encourage this? Because this is fascinating. This is totally fascinating. Um, anything we can do to encourage this? Yeah, great question. So um, Japanese game developers at Nintendo and other big, you know, the big game dev houses are notoriously um, secretive about sharing corporate history, um, especially if something was perceived as being a failure. Um, I got to experience this firsthand when I spent the summer of 2013 in Tokyo. Um, I flew to Tokyo to get an interview with someone who had declined to speak to me. And I just flew there hoping they would change their minds <laughs> by the time I got there, and they did um, after my third request. And um, I was very heavily monitored, and I, I think there was this idea that I was doing like corporate espionage, or I was, I was going to write a hit piece on how this video game had been a failure. And I went and I said, I love this stuff, are you kidding me? And eventually they, they sort of were like, okay, but we're not gonna tell you our real names. I mean, it was, it was very secretive. Um, and so it is difficult to get those stories. Um, it can be difficult, especially a company like Nintendo is just notoriously um, tight about what their employees can say. <laughs> and a lot of people are also lifers. They don't want to put themselves in jeopardy with management, so it is difficult. Um, I think also there's a question of, was this product ever intended for the Japanese market? We don't have a lot of clues on that. Um, we think maybe yes. We think maybe that they tried to do this in Japan first, and Nintendo of Japan passed, and then they sent it to Nintendo of America. It seems a little odd that they would develop something in Japan with a Japanese toy manufacturer just to ship it to the US. So there's a uh, the possibility that they may have tried to market this or get, get rally interest internally in Japan and there, it wasn't there and, th and they passed. So, but it's a mystery. <laughs> it would make a great uh, Netflix stuff. <laughs> Next question. In your research, have you come across any finished products that were advertised as being knit by one of these machines? Have I ever come across a product that's been knit by, that's been made by an, one of the Nintendo knitting machines? Right, or something that's like, you know, prototype or something like that. Has there been any, like, evidence? So really, the, the flyer is the only official evidence, and then the photo from CES is the only third-party documentation um, that exists. I did show, I don't know, I have to press this button forever, but this, um, this little thing I showed at the beginning that was this knit Mario. Where are we? Let's keep going back, back, and back, and back, and back, and back, keep going back. Back to the beginning. This one. This was actually made on the machine that we got off of the auction. So we did test it with the patterns from the software. Um, it was, it's not perfect. Uh, we had an issue with the tensioning, especially when you change yarn color. Um, so that's what those weights are for. You're actually meant to clip weights to the bottom of the piece so that it's pulling on the yarn on the machine to get really tight tension. Otherwise, you get these sort of Lucy stitches, loose stitches, especially where the colors change. So this is what it would have looked like. So that's kind of cool. And the box, uh, the box for the knitting machine, those, we saw those uh, like pieces of sushi. And those were, that was actually a pattern that was included with the toy. So those would have been presumably made on that machine. We're just now going to the other complete opposite side of the deck, these. Um, the pattern for this was included in this instruction manual. So one of the things you could make are these kind of rice ball pillows. So that's what they would have looked like, but we don't have any physical hard evidence or anything like that. I saw a hand here, okay. I'm not sure that this is so much a question, but I'm A, curious as to whether you're a knitter. It sounds like you might be. I am. And then I was also curious about whether you had any insight into when, they, when Royal actually put the knitting machine out you know, independent of Nintendo, how successful it was as a toy, 
and whether people practicing and using it were actually knitters who were just hoping to you know experience something differently in knitting and and whether it was successful because you know knitting is an experience and why do you want a machine to do it or how does the machine change that experience i'm yeah. kind of curious about that yeah i will say in general my my feeling is that um crafting toys have been kind of perennially popular in japan especially as like sort of girl i mean we have that in the u.s too i think like friendship bracelet kits and we have some some sort of toys that are sort of oriented to crafting but i think that's been um, like a really big part of the girls toy market in Japan. Uh, I don't have specific numbers on how these toys did, but what I can tell you is that they continued to make knitting machines after this. So they weren't just offloading this like one-off, like, okay, Nintendo will release this, but they continued to make knitting machines. And in fact, um, well, Royal doesn't make uh, knitting machines anymore, but Bandai and some of the other toy makers are still making, you can actually buy a modern version that does not look that different from this. So I think they were popular enough that the toy industry kept making these. Um, I, I don't think that Royal's knitting machine was the first toy knitting machine. Um, I think that I, I have seen some of those coming out of the 1970s. I think some of those were even released in the US, like Mattel or someone may have brought over a Tomy or a Japanese, I think they were typically made in Japan, and then sometimes a US company would rebrand them for sale in the US. I don't think they were ever that popular in the US, but in Japan, they've continued to have some popularity. Okay, last question, here you go. Hi, so um, when you were talking about the Singer Game Boy sewing machine, you said that it was really well received by teens and kids, but that the market just wasn't there. Do you think that it would have been that it would be well received like later on in time, maybe during 2020 when we were all stuck at home? <laughs> um, because I know a lot of people got into small things like that. A so. lot of people got into making masks during COVID. Yeah. Um, I'm also a, a sewer and I taught a lot of people how to um, use a sewing machine because there was a time where you could not buy masks. I don't know if you all remember that. And people were making masks out of like T-shirts and stuff. Um, so yeah, there was definitely an, an interest, a renewed interest in sewing that, that happened with uh, COVID. I don't know that this was a, a timing problem. I think really it was a, it was a where do you sell this thing problem. And I don't know that we've overcome that because today, where do people buy video games? Well, you know, digital, like you buy a digital copy. So that's peripherals are out of the picture there. Um, maybe as far as retailers like Amazon, Target, I think a lot of these things sort of, when they're totally new like this and big, and they're a big investment, um, there has to be some method of discovery. So I would say if, if, I were, <laughs> if I were in charge of marketing for a product like this today, I would send it to a bunch of influencers <laughs> on like the YouTube channels, TikTok, and I would get them making stuff with this. Um, but it's a hard problem to solve. Like how do you, is, there's a, it's a product that doesn't really already have a place in the marketplace. And it's potentially, uh, I think at this time, uh, girls were playing Game Boy Color, but I think the video game industry in general was pretty like targeted to younger male audience. And sewing machines were kind of targeted to an older female audience. And so it's hard to find the place where those could meet in the middle. And I think that was the big sticking point for that device. I don't know if we do any better today, but yeah, my uh, uh, social media marketing strategy would be my 2023 answer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, one more. One more, yes. Hi. Uh, I found your talk really fascinating, and I especially enjoyed this process of seeing, the, like, the lens of a historian, like, what what that experience was like. I, w I was curious to hear, like, is it common for there to be this D this depth of forensic research and like how how has it changed over time? It, obviously now things are a lot more documented, but maybe still hard to find. So I'm just curious about the process there. Yeah, how has like video game history process changed over time? Um, I think this kind of forensic research should happen more. I actually don't think it's super common. Um, I'll say like we didn't get paid to do this, right? <laughs> like. <laughs> We did it because we thought it was so cool and we were excited about it. Like I bought my own plane ticket to San Francisco, okay? Like, so, no, I don't think it's going on that much. Um, 
Uh, and it's challenging because I think a lot of video game history is sort of done by enthusiasts and people being like, I remember this from my childhood, which is okay. Um, but that means a lot of things get left out. Nobody remembers the Nintendo knitting machine. And so nobody's gonna research it because they remember it from their childhood, right? And in particular, like when you're fueled by nostalgia, that history is always gonna be biased. It's probably gonna be positive. A lot of video game history is very like enthusiast and like video games, they used to be like 8-bit and now they're like really good. <laughs> like, so these stories of like technological progress and um, like really rose colored lenses that come out of the fact that many historians are coming at this from a personal perspective. And a lot of video game collections like the National Video Game Museum, uh, those collections are personal collections that were professionalized, right? Um, so yeah, I wish more things like this were happening. And I think in particular when you have these lost histories and also girls games uh, that are sort of derided or they're seen as not as culturally significant, then we don't get those in-depth looks. So uh, more important to me than this one story is that process of like, it's not all about your childhood. <laughs> there, there are other interesting things happening. And actually these, these lost histories are more at risk for true loss right? I mean, this is so close to being a non-story. <laughs> this is so close to being like absolutely nobody knows anything about this and this talk didn't happen and none of you are here. Um, <laughs> so, so yeah, I think that's like what I, what I promote more than any, any one story is this practice of reclaiming these and recuperating these almost really gone histories because they're not necessarily associated with someone's childhood nostalgia. Yeah. All right, thanks so much, Rachel. Yeah.